Well, good morning. My name is Phil Payne, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff and get a privilege to spend some time with you this morning. If you have a Bible with you, I'd love for you to open it to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25 is where we're headed. And as we settle into Matthew 25 and spend a little bit of time there this morning, welcome to church. Welcome to church. Good morning, morning, right? (laughs) Boom, we get excited about that. At some point in time this morning, you decided I'm going to go to church. I'm going to get up and uh, I'm going to get dressed and I'm going to maybe have some breakfast, grab a cup of coffee, grab something, and I'm going to head to church. I was thinking about it this week. Church has been a huge part of my life for most of my life. I'm in my 59th year of life. I grew up in one of those homes where my my dad and mom were involved in church, and I went from when I was very little. In fact, there were times way back in the day we went to church twice on a Sunday. Crazy thought. Crazy thought. But we would actually go sometimes Sunday night. Yeah, way back when that was a thing, right? I I, I did some math. I think that I have been in church uh, a little over 3,000 times in my life on multiple continents, in multiple languages, in different places, and, and, and probably for you, maybe you would look at it and say, I've been at this for a long time, or maybe this is your first week in church. But you ever stop and wonder and think, what's it going to be like when this is done when your life is done or, or when God decides that he is going to return and, and the Bible says that Jesus is returning someday, have you ever considered that? Have you spent any time thinking about that? What is it going to be like when you're standing, sitting, kneeling, prostrate, we don't really know, in front of Jesus? In fact, I want to just give you a second to think about that and consider that thought that you've come to the end of your life. Maybe your life comes to an end today, this week. Maybe it's in a year from now. Maybe Christ returns. Well, for whatever reason, you find yourself in front of Jesus. What's that going to be like? What's that going to be like? What's that moment going to be like? What's that conversation going to be like? What's that experience going to be like? And for some of us, we we kind of think about that and think, man, I I hope that's a cool experience. For some of us, we think, ooh, I don't don't, don't know. That, That sounds terrifying to me. For a lot of people, there's some mystery in there, And yet I'm grateful that Scripture gives us a little insight into that. In fact, the disciples asked that question. We go to Matthew 24, just the chapter before where we're going to dig into today. And in Matthew 24, 3, the disciples asked that question of Jesus. They've been hanging out with him for a couple years. And they say, hey, what, what will it be like at the end of the age? What's going to happen then? That's a good question. It's a question we probably shouldn't be asking. It's a question we should probably be aware of. What's it going to be like? What do I want it to be like? What does the Bible tell me it's going to be like when I stand in front of Jesus? Well, Jesus gives the disciples some some immediate answers. He says to them in in Luke 24, first of all, he says, no one knows when that's going to be. He said, I don't know. The angels don't know. Only the Father knows. So first of all, don't be looking for that. Don't be declaring that, right? Don't be, but just know that nobody knows. But it is coming. It is reality. And and then he says to them, you know what? Because no one knows, we need to be ready. We need to pay attention. And then in Matthew 25, Jesus tells them three stories. Three stories about what does it look like to be ready. That if we met Jesus today, if we met Jesus at the end of this week, if you were standing in front of Jesus soon, would you and I be ready? And Jesus tells them three stories. The first story he tells them, he tells them about ten virgins waiting for a bridegroom. It's about a wedding. 
And in, in biblical times, the custom was that a whole group of people, the, the, the people involved in the wedding, would be prepared for the bridegroom to come. And the bridegroom, when he arrived, the wedding would start. And Jesus tells a story about him that there were five people in the, in the wedding party that were ready and five people in the wedding party that were not ready. And the bridegroom all of a sudden shows up unexpected. And five of them that were ready, they get honored. And the five that are not ready, Jesus says, you know what, they're wicked servants. In the first story, Jesus tells them that, you know what, you need to keep watch. You need to be vigilant. If you're thinking about it, you're going to meet Jesus, that should at least be on our radar somewhere. Pay attention. Don't just put it off to the side. And I think a lot of us do that. We just put it off to the side like, well, I don't know the answer to that, so I'm not going to worry about it. And Jesus says that's a bad strategy. In, in the first story, he says part of your strategy is you need to be ready. You need to be watching, paying attention. And then he tells them a second story. In the second story, he says a man went on a journey. And before he went on the journey, he gave three of his servants some gold. The first one, he gave five bags of gold. The second one, two bags of gold. The third one, one bag of gold, according to their ability. And then he came back. And he said, what did you do with the gold that I gave you? And the first one says, hey, I took those five, and I, I invested in it, and I did great things, and I have five more. And he says, man, great job. The second one says, ah, you know, I, I really didn't do anything, but I still have my two. And Jesus is like, oh, that's not good. And the third one says, I was really afraid, and I took the one, and I buried it in a hole. And Jesus said, oh, that's really not good. You're a wicked servant. In fact, take the one and give it to the one with five. In the second story, Jesus says, you know what, while we're waiting for his return, God's given us all abilities. He's given us all talents, skills, and he wants you to be using those for his kingdom. Not only do we need to be on watch, not only do we need to be thinking about how has God equipped you and what are you doing with what God's given you. And then we come to the third story. And the third story is what I want us to take a look at this morning in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31. And it says this, and you can read with me. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on the glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him. And he'll separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Now this was pretty custom in, in biblical times. There were a lot of times during the day that sheep and goats would graze together. They would just take advantage of the grass, the hillside. But at nighttime, the shepherd would always separate out sheep on one side, goats on the other. Part of it to pay attention to his flock, part of it because they had different needs at nighttime. And Jesus says, this is what it's going to be like. Not only should we be vigilant and paying attention, not only should we be using the skills that we have, but there's a third thing I want you to think about. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. But then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry, feed you? When were you thirsty and we gave you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison? When did we go to visit you? And then the king will say, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. And then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick, I was in prison, and you did not look after me. And then they will say, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and we didn't help you? 
And he will say to them, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. And then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is a crazy story. This is a crazy part of Scripture here. It's the third story Jesus tells the disciples when they ask the question, what's it going to be like at the end of all of this when we're standing before you? And Jesus says, hey, first of all, you need to pay attention. Pay attention. Don't just take it for granted and get caught up in your own lives. And he tells them a story about the wedding, the bridegroom. And then he says, you know what? I've given you skills and abilities. Use those. Don't just bury them in a hole. Do something with what I've given you. And then the third story here, the one that we're going to focus on for a few minutes here, apparently it matters to Jesus how we treat the people around us. Specifically, how we treat people that are less fortunate or in dire circumstances. Jesus separates people out. He welcomes them in or he sends them out based on how they treated people that were hungry, thirsty, naked, in prison, destitute. Jesus says to them, hey, you know what? When you took a step towards them and did something about that, you did it to me. And when you chose to look at them, maybe with a cynical eye, maybe with skepticism, maybe even with a little bit of judgment, maybe with a little attitude that, you know what, if you really wanted to help yourself, you could have helped yourself. When you did that, you know what, you did that to me, and you ignored me. We find ourselves today at the very end of a a sermon series called The Big Story. We're talking about the big story of God, the story that involves creation and corruption and redemption and restoration. And we talked about this last week, that we love the first three parts of this story for sure. Most of us would say, yes, I believe that God created all things. I see that in the Bible, and I know that corruption happened because of sin. And man, I'm so glad that Jesus left heaven and he came here to earth and he redeemed me and he redeemed you. I love that. But God says in his word, that's not the end of the story. God's heart is not only that creation and corruption and redemption happen, but that restoration would happen. Christ said in his word that he has come to reconcile all things to himself, both in heaven and in earth, on earth. And the challenge for a lot of us is that we find ourselves disconnected, especially to that fourth part of the story. Sometimes we're just disconnected by life. We get selfish, we get self-centered, we think about ourselves, even when it comes to the gospel, I'm so glad that the gospel has come to me. But we forget that God has invited you and invited me to be his ambassador, to be his representative, to join him in reconciling all things to himself. And that's what Paul wrote, that he has given you, he has given me the ministry of reconciliation. It's a crazy plan that God would think. You know what? I, I'm, I want to invite you into that. I want you to think about the people that live at the end of your driveway. I want you to think about the people that live in your neighborhood. I want you to think about the people that live in this community and around the world. And your job and my job, our invitation is to join in God's work. And sometimes we get disconnected from that because we just get selfish and we think about ourselves. Sometimes we get disconnected from that because we compartmentalize. We go, oh, no, 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 what, what Jesus was talking about when he's talking about reconciliation is spiritual reconciliation. That's what he was talking about. See, when people are needy, it's really just that their sins are what needs to be forgiven. The only problem with that is the Bible. Because that's not what God teaches here in this story, Jesus says, you know what? How you treated people is how you treated me. Jesus said, if you give a cup of cold water in my name, it means something. We compartmentalize. 
We say things like, well, no, it's just the government's job to, to give away welfare. I don't really think they should do that, but they do it, and so that's their job. My job is just to win souls, just to, to kind of speak to the spiritual aspect of Christianity. Now, do we need to talk about our souls? Absolutely. Did Jesus come? Did he leave heaven and die on a cross and pay the penalty for our sin? Absolutely. Are we saved by grace and by the, the forgiveness of our sins? Absolutely. Absolutely. And does Christ want to be your Savior and your Lord? Absolutely. But for a lot of us in Christian circles, we compartmentalize that the gospel is primarily for people inside the church and just to make my life better. And Jesus said, I've come to reconcile all things, all things, both in heaven and on earth. In fact, Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, in verse 18, we have that up there, Tamara. Why did Jesus come to earth? The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recover his sight to the blind, set the oppressed free, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The gospel is not just for you and for me. The gospel is meant to holistically impact our world. Last week at the end of our sermon, I left you with some questions to think about of, do I really understand the entire story of God? Am I living out the entire story of God? Do I have spiritual myopia? Right? My, myopia in our world today, you think about myopia and you go, I, I have the ability to see things up close, but I can't see very far away. And we go to the optometrist and say, hey, I, I, need, I need help. And, and, and the, the optometrist gives you a pair of glasses. And instead of squinting and going, I can't really see very far away, I, I can just see what's in front of me. The optometrist says, you know, I want you to be able to see all things, both near and far. And when you and I look at the gospel as only intended for me and my life, that's like having spiritual myopia. I just focus on what's in front of me, my life, my family, my job, my eternity. And Jesus says, I want to give you the lens of the gospel. I want to give you the truth of Scripture to see all things, that God has a heart for all of the world. And how does God want to use you and me to be part of restoring all that was lost? Sometimes we get disconnected to why Jesus came. This morning, I want to suggest to you that maybe another place that we get disconnected is we get disconnected from the realities of the world the realities of the world. We, we think about what's normal, right? You ever stop and ask that, what's normal? You know, you ever take your kids to Disneyland? You go to an amusement park and, and, and you're there and, you know, you, you buy the $14 hot dog and, you know, you, you spend all day in lines and, and it's awesome. And, and maybe your kids say something like, I, I wish we could just live here. And you're like, oh, that sounds like hell on earth, right? <laughs> No, I don't want to live here. And you remind your kids, no, no, this isn't normal, right? No, this is like vacation. It's awesome. And it's wonderful and we enjoy it to a degree. But it's not normal. Or you find yourself on vacation and it's so good, you know, people bringing you cold beverages that are wonderful. You have no schedule. You're showing up just whatever you want to do, and you think, oh, if I could just live like this. And then your spouse lovingly says, well, we return back to normal on Monday. And you're like, stop, don't say that. And sometimes we get caught, right, between what we think is normal and what's real life. Sometimes normal for us is oat milk in my latte, right? No, don't, don't be giving me that whole milk, right? I need oat milk in my latte, and that latte better be just the right temperature. And we get kind of lulled into thinking that oat milk in my latte is normal when the reality is 2 billion people on this planet, 7 billion live here, 2 billion people don't have access to clean drinking water. I'm fighting with a barista over the temperature of my latte, and two billion people don't have access to clean water. 
I hate traffic, right? I don't want traffic. This week I was over in Seattle. Hit that, you know, 405 five corridor. Takes you a week to go six miles, right? You go, I hate traffic. But you know what the reality is? 80% of the world doesn't even own a car. You know who doesn't hate traffic? People that walk everywhere. People that don't have a vehicle. People that don't have access to the things that you and I have access to. Nine hours of screen time a day. Between my computer and my phone and my tablet, and I'm, and I'm taking all this in, and I, and I got my screen time, and I want to make sure my kids don't have too much screen time, and, and we think about screen time, and the reality is 746 million people don't even have electricity in their home. They don't have electricity. Not because somebody tripped a breaker, not because, you know, a squirrel ate through the transformer. It's really annoying. No, they don't have electricity, period. They haven't had it, and it's not coming anytime soon. They're still doing things like building a fire to cook. They don't have electricity. Unlimited Wi-Fi everywhere I go. It better be there, right? It better be there. There better be that moment. I I need that Wi-Fi. Seven million people on this planet live in refugee camps. And in most refugee camps, they're getting one meal a day. They've left their country, they've left their home, torn apart by civil war, or things were so bad in their life that they decided walking to another country was better than where they were at. And they're living in a refugee camp. $136 billion spent on our pet industry. Get your head wrapped around that, $136 billion a year. Now, before you call me a pet hater, I do have a cat. I love animals. But we spend $136 billion a year on our pets. A billion people are hungry and malnourished every day on this planet. They're not taking in enough calories to have positive health. I was thinking about getting my master's degree. I don't know. What would you get it in? I don't even know that. I, well, I, you know, you're going to get a I, I'm thinking about my master's. There's nothing wrong with your master's degree. Go get it. But 800 million people on this planet can't read. They're illiterate. 800 million people can't do what most of the people in our world are doing in pre-K and kindergarten. I sat with a couple of my grandkids this week who read to me out of a book. So excited that they can put those letters and words together. We celebrated, look at you, you're learning to read. 800 million people on this planet can't do that. Average American, that's you and me, we live on $90 a day. That's our food, our shelter, our health care. That's a little bit of savings, that's some vacation, that's our clothing. Most of us live on $90 a day. Do you know that a billion people live on a dollar a day? You, 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 don't, you don't even know what to do with a dollar. There, there are times when you see a dollar and you're like, ah, yeah, I think I'll pick it up. Oh, no, I'm definitely picking it up. But a dollar? If I said to you tomorrow, you know what, as you go throughout your day tomorrow, you can only spend a dollar. And you've you got to take care of your food, your shelter, your health care, your today, your tomorrow, on a dollar. You're like, well, does that come with any coupons, right? I mean, are you going to help me out here? Hey, what time's that food box giveaway? Oh, that'll work, right? You and I, we, we don't know what to think to do with a dollar. 2.6 billion people live on $2 a day. Do the math on that. That's, that's for a billion people, that's $365 a year. A year. 
You and I sometimes will go out and spend half of that on a meal. What is normal? And have we been lulled into thinking that how we live our lives is normal? And the truth is what God calls us and invites us to do is to pick up our head and open our eyes and see that for most of us, we're not living normal. We're living way above normal. Way, way, way above normal. You see, the gap is widening between the haves and the have-nots. And then John, John has the audacity to write this. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, do not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. See, the Bible says we know what love is because Christ first loved us. We didn't invent love. We didn't come up with the idea of love. God came up with the idea of love. And I love the verse in Scripture, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he formed a committee to talk about how much he loved the world. For God so loved the world that they got together in heaven and they had a fantastic conversation about how much they love the world. That's not what that verse says, right? For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. For those of you that are not English majors, that's a verb. That's an action word, right? Right? Jesus willingly gave up his place in heaven. He did not consider his position as something to be held on to, something to be grasped. What? Me go? I'm not going. I'm Jesus. I'm part of the Trinity. I have a very comfortable spot here in heaven. No, Paul wrote that he did not consider his position as something to be held on to, but he made himself obedient and became obedient even unto death. No greater love has this than a man gives up his life for another, speaking about Jesus. And then Jesus says in John 15, as I have loved you, so love one another. You see, what do we do with the widening gap between the haves and the have-nots? Now, I want you to consider just for a second this chart. I want you to consider that when God created all things, right, God's at the top. God created all things, and, and he had all things in mind, and this is how the story starts. He was thinking about us as people, right, all mankind made in his image. He made mankind in his image, And he wanted relationship as individuals with people. But then God says in Genesis, it's not good that man be alone. And he he creates Eve and he, he creates the first community. And God cares about that community. And he says, hey, it matters how you treat each other. But then also remember what God told Adam and Eve. You know what? I've given you creation and I've given you dominion over creation. Go and take care of it. And they work the garden. God cared about self, God cared about community, God cared about the rest of creation. And then sin enters this, and it's broken. Our relationship as people is broken, our community is broken, and all of creation is broken. God's intent, the story starts out that way, and let me give you a heads up, the story's going to end that way too. We go to Revelation and we see that God has reconciled all things, all nations, all people, every tribe, every tongue. And there's no more suffering. There's no more disease. There's no more disharmony. There's no more wars. There's no more conflict. God's story starts and God's story ends with God reconciling all things to himself. And today, today we live in that liminal space in between, in the now but the not yet, right? 
And God invites us in to his heart and his heartbeat and his desire, not just for spiritual and me self-reconciliation, but all things. And the answer to that, the biblical answer to that is shalom. The, the gospel, the good news. The gospel is about justice. It's about reconciliation. Reconciliation between God and humanity. You see, when we think about poverty for a second, and I want you to think about poverty and, and ask yourself even that question, why does poverty exist? Why do we have the haves and the have-nots? Really, poverty exists. And the answer is not just to give stuff, right? Because when, when you think about that, right, whatever you think the greatest problem is, that tends to be your answer. And so if you look at it and you go, well, you know what the world really needs is clean drinking water, then we dig wells. What the world really needs is more education, so we build schools. What the world really needs is more jobs, and so we come up with job services. Now, we need wells, we need schools, and we need jobs. But mankind's greatest need is reconciliation to their creator and to each other. You see, look at that last quote. Poverty's roots lie in broken relationships. Relationships that just don't work. They're not just. They're not harmonious. Poverty is the absence of shalom. And all of us are affected, even if we are materially well off. Let me show you this video real quick put out by the Bible Project. Check out just a quick thought on shalom. The word peace is common in most languages. People can talk about peace treaties or times of peace. It means the absence of war. And in the Bible, the word peace can refer to the absence of conflict, but it also points to the presence of something better in its place. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is erene. The most basic meaning of shalom is complete or whole. The word can refer to a stone that has a perfect whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to a completed stone wall that has no gaps and no missing bricks. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness, wholeness. It's like Job who says his tents are in a state of shalom because he counted his flock and no animals are missing. This is why shalom can refer to a person's well-being. Like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield, he asked about their shalom. The core idea is that life is complex, full of moving parts and relationships and situations. And when any of these is out of alignment or missing, your shalom breaks down. Life is no longer whole. It needs to be restored. In fact, that's the basic meaning of shalom when you use it as a verb. To bring shalom literally means to make complete or restore. So Solomon brings shalom to the unfinished temple when he completes it. Or if your animal accidentally damages your neighbor's field, you shalom them by giving them a complete repayment for their loss. You take what's missing and you restore it to wholeness. The same goes for human relationships. In the book of Proverbs, to reconcile and heal a broken relationship is to bring shalom. And when rival kingdoms make shalom in the Bible, it doesn't just mean they stop fighting, it also means they start working together for each other's benefit. This state of shalom is what Israel's kings were supposed to cultivate, and it rarely happened. So the prophet Isaiah, he looked forward to a future king, a prince of shalom. And his reign would bring shalom with no end. A time when God would make a covenant of shalom with his people and make right all wrongs and heal all that's been broken. This is why Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of Irene. Remember, that's the Greek word for peace. Jesus came to offer his peace to others. Like when he said to his followers, my peace I give to you all. The apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and God when he died and rose from the dead. The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. This is why the apostle Paul can say Jesus himself is our Irene. He was the whole complete human that I am made to be but have failed to be. And now he gives me his life as a gift. And this means that Jesus' followers are now called to create peace. Paul instructed local churches to keep their unity through the bond of peace, which requires humility and patience and bearing with others in love. Becoming people of peace means participating in the life of Jesus, who reconciled all things in heaven and on earth, restoring peace through his death and resurrection. 
So peace takes a lot of work because it's not just the absence of conflict. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness, whether it's in our lives, our relationships, or in our world. And that's the rich biblical concept of peace. Hey, thanks for watching this word study video by the Bible Project. We make lots of other videos. So good. So good. That's put out by the Bible Project. You want to spend some time, you get lost down the rabbit hole of YouTube or, or check out, so just check out the Bible Project sometime. They're based down out of Oregon. Do a phenomenal job of taking truth from Scripture and bringing it alive. And in that video, he talks about shalom, Irene, that Jesus came to bring peace, but not just peace with us, wholeness, completeness. You see, the other challenge, and here's the irony, is that not only are, are we sometimes disconnected from, from God and his message, we're, we're disconnected from the reality of, of the poor, but we're also disconnected from the real purpose and meaning in our lives. I think a lot of us as Christ followers, we sometimes maybe out loud or, or, or maybe not so out loud ask the question, is, is this all there is? Is there not more meaning and purpose here to following Christ? Yeah, I, I know Jesus, and I, and I have my eternity taken care of, but, but what about the now? Where, where's, where's the purpose and the meaning in my life? It's almost sometimes we, we treat Christianity like our retirement. We're going to get to it someday out there. I want to plan for it for sure. But Christ said, I've come to give you life and give it to you abundantly now. The thief comes to kill and destroy, Jesus said. And I think the enemy has come in a lot of our lives and tricked us into thinking that our life is really about us. And the more that we grasp for our life and ourselves, it's like trying to grab a hold of water. No matter how much you try to grab that water, it slips right through your hand because life was never meant to be about you and about me. It's about living with kingdom eyes and Christ in charge of all things in our life. I think sometimes we're disconnected from the real purpose and meaning in our lives. We see the goal of our Christian lives as piety or trying not to sin. Bible studies, worship conferences, Christian camps and retreats, and those are all wonderful things. But we need to love and serve the king. We need to pay attention to the kingdom. We need both. We need to worship the king and serve the king, but we got to pay attention to the kingdom. See, that's the expectation that Jesus has in Matthew 25, that we will be paying attention, that we will be using the resources that God has given us, and that how we live and how we follow Jesus has got to impact the people around us and the people we see every single day. Jesus came to redeem and to reconcile all things, and he invites us to be a part of that. And I want you to think about this morning that living out the entire story of God, creation, corruption, redemption, and restoration, has the power and the potential to reconnect you and me with God's heart, God's voice, God's mandate, and the reality of living with purpose and meaning. I love this quote from Nathan Montgomery when he says this, you know what, I want my life to be a testimony that screams, I know God, I loved God, and because of it, I loved people. I loved people. So what do we do with this, right? You go, okay, great, there's a gap between the haves and the have-nots. And I, most of us would say, we're in the haves, right? I know, we always want to compare up. We always want to say, well, I don't, I don't have what those people have. Most of the time we compare up, we seldom compare down. We seldom compare ourselves with people living in a refugee camp. We seldom compare ourselves with people who have no electricity, the 25,000 children that will die today out of malnourishment. 
You and I will have at least three meals, probably more. Most of the time we compare up. We rarely compare down. Is it possible? Is it possible that poverty and injustice exists? Not because of evil in the world. Because of the people who have the truth don't care enough. We're not very good at sharing. As long as I have my stuff, as long as I'm good, that's as far as I'm concerned. And Jesus invites us to move past that. He invites us into the process of restoration and reconciliation. Let me give you a couple things to consider as as we kind of wrap this up. Here's number one. Let's stop seeing poverty as a blessing versus non-blessing issue. If I'm just 100% transparent, I'm really tired of hearing this phrase. Well, you know what? I think God just loves America a little bit more. I, I think we're just a little more blessed here in this country. That's not the truth. And that's not what Scripture says. We got to stop looking at blessing versus non-blessing. You don't have the stuff you have, and I don't have the stuff I have because God loves us more. That's really bad theology. Now, you didn't do anything to be born into the family you were born into. That's just a absolute opportunity. But I guarantee you, someday when you and I stand before God, and we will, I guarantee you he's going to ask at least two questions the first one is simple, right? That, that's, do you know my son? Do you know Jesus? And, and for a lot of us, we're going to say, yes, yeah, I do know Jesus. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. Right? If, if we don't get question one right, we're not going to make it to question two. But assume you get question one right, and you say, yeah, I do know Jesus. Here's the second question coming. I guarantee God's going to ask this question. It's all over Scripture. Here's question two that God's going to ask each one of us. What did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with what I gave you? Because I gave it to you. Did you bury it in a hole? Or did you invest it? Did you see it increase? Did you treat the people around you the way that Jesus wants us to treat people around us? But we got to stop looking at poverty as blessing versus non-blessing. Here's number two. We need to repent from our pride and thinking we're just a little bit better than others. And that's deep in this heart right here. That's in my heart this week as I'm driving through our town. And I saw another guy on the corner with a little sign that just said lunch. And the ironic was I was eating my lunch in my car while I saw him. And the ugly part of my heart said, well, he probably should get some work. And God convicted me right here. You know what, Phil? You need to repent from that pride and thinking you're just a little bit better than somebody else. Because that's not for me. That's from the enemy who's come to thief, to kill and destroy your heart and fill you with cynicism. Here's the third thing. We need to ask God to break our hearts for the world. Ask God for compassion, for spiritual eyes to see. See, God, without compassion, we're not going anywhere. Jesus, as he walked on planet Earth, as he saw people, Scripture says he was filled with compassion. It touched him in his inner heart. You and I need to regularly pray, God, would you give me compassion? Here's the next thing I want you to think about. I want you to realize that joy and purpose and freedom come from serving, not being served. This is what Jesus said, right? I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. And and the the, the counterintuitive thing for us is is, is we see all the images in our world and and the media and the movies that that the good life, the good life is when I have my feet up and, and people are serving me and they're bringing me stuff. But that's not the good life. That life leads to emptiness. 
And we see people with more money than they will ever spend on this planet. Absolutely miserable. We see people with all of the things that should make them happy. And they're miserable. Why? Because joy comes and purpose and freedom comes from serving, not being served. Next week, the team that went to Mexico, they're going to stand up here on this stage. And I've talked to a couple of them, but not all of them. But they're going to stand on this stage next week, and over and over and over again, here's what you're going to hear. We had the most amazing time sleeping in a dorm where the beds were really hard and the mattresses were like nothing. And, and it was hot and it was dirty and we only took two showers during the week and maybe we didn't even take that many. And they're, they're going to talk about all the reasons why they should have been miserable, but they're going to say that was one of the best weeks of my life. Why? Because they stepped out of their own comfort zone and served someone else. I've heard it over and over and over again, food box giveaway that we'll do tomorrow. Tomorrow at one o'clock in this parking lot, we'll give away food to needy in our community. Over and over and over again, I hear people that come to that event say this, that was the most amazing afternoon I've had in a long time. Why? Because when we focus on ourselves, life is empty. Oh, there's some happy moments, but it's like going to Disneyland, right? Just that consumerism coming at me all the time. Like, oh, it's just good to get back home. That was fun for a day. But joy and freedom and purpose come from serving. See, that's what Jesus said. If you really want to find your life, lose it for others. The more we try to hold on to our lives, the more we're self-focused, the more empty our lives are. We end up with more stuff than we can imagine. Going, is this all there is? And Jesus says, there is more than this. Find joy and purpose and freedom in serving. At some point in time, we have to ask ourselves, how much is enough? How much is enough? Live on a budget. See, is it possible that God has given you abundant resources, not just so that you can get one more thing, but so that you can give it away and serve someone else. Live on a budget. Ask yourself that question. How much is enough? Where are the people around me who have needs? God, would you show me how I could be a conduit of your love and your resources? Five bags of gold, two bags of gold, one bag of gold. God's giving you gold. What are you doing with that? Are you investing it? Are you just treading water or are you burying it in a hole? What do you want to hear Jesus say? Well done. Well done. That's what I gave it for you. And I'm going to give you more. And I'm going to give you joy. And I'm going to give you purpose. You're going to walk with me. You're going to be part of reconciling. Now, and there's nothing wrong with vacation. There's nothing wrong with, with living. God's given all that to you. Enjoy it. But we've got to ask that question, how much is enough? And God, if you've given it to me, help me be free with it. And it's not about legalistically checking off a list. Wrestle with it. Think about it. How, how can I give stuff away? And then the last thing, do what you can. Do what you can. Don't do what you can't. You're like, wow, Phil, you talked about, you know, people don't have water. You and I are not going to solve clean drinking water for 2 billion people today. We're not. Now, maybe you need to dig into that idea. But when this topic comes up, we go macro, right? And we're like, wow, this is big global issues we can't do anything about. And you're right. They're challenging. But what can you do? Would it be possible to put bottles of drinking water in your car? And when you see somebody on the corner, you give them a bottle of water. You could do that. I could do that. I remember having some guys here in our church, and they were talking about homeless challenges in Moses Lake. And somebody asked him, hey, how can we help the homeless? And the guy kind of laughed, and he goes, you want, you want a really crazy idea? I'll tell you how to, how to help the homeless here in Moses Lake. Put socks in your car. The guy's like, socks in my car? And he said, yeah, you know what most homeless people really complain about? They don't have clean socks. Go, That's a brilliant idea. I could put a couple pairs of clean socks in my car. 
And when I see somebody in need, I can't solve all their issues, but I could give them socks. Do something. Maybe it's a bottle of water. Maybe it's some socks. Maybe it's coming tomorrow and being a part of the food giveaway. You're like, oh, isn't that kind of awkward? No, it's really not. Hey, pile up some food boxes out here, and some people will give them away, and, and some people will pray, and some people just meet people. Come tomorrow. Now, before you come tomorrow, would you walk out to the connections table out there? We just put your name on the sign-up sheet so we know you're coming. If you don't do that, come anyway, right? But be here tomorrow. Be a part of that. Do something. Serve Moses Lake. Lynn Logan is the director of Serve Moses Lake. She goes to church here. A couple weeks ago, I was talking to Lynn Logan, and she just said this. You know what, Phil? We, we desperately need more volunteers. She said, last month, we had hundreds of clients show up. She said, you know how many volunteers I had last month? I'm like, no, Lynn, I don't know. She said, I had three. I had three volunteers from all of our community for hundreds of clients. Could you go one time a month for a couple hours to serve Moses Lake and help? Could I go one afternoon to serve Moses Lake and surf? There are opportunities right in front of us to say, God, I want to be a part of restoration. I want to be a part of reconciling. And here's the greatest reason to do something. Every time you and I take a step towards Jesus, it fights off the cynicism and skepticism of our own hearts. Because it's really easy to get skeptical. It's really easy to be cynical. It's really easy to get a hard heart. And when I choose to serve somebody else for no thing, nothing coming back my way, God softens my heart. Maybe it's the bottom of your driveway. Maybe it's somebody you work with. Maybe it's taking time to hear a story from somebody else around you. God invites us into restoration and reconciliation. That's God's heart. Creation, corruption. Redemption, restoration. God is reconciling all things to himself. Someday he's going to solve it all. Absolutely. We're living right here, right now. In the not yet but still the now, right? And you and I get an opportunity today to say, God, give me compassion. Open my eyes. Use me as an ambassador because you've given me, us, this church, the message of reconciliation for the least, the last, and the lost. And someday when we stand before Jesus, he would look at you, he would look at me, he would look at our church, and he would say, hey, well done. Good job. You didn't get it all right, you weren't perfect, but you kept taking a step, listening for my voice, and responding in obedience. Let's do what we can. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that we have been reconciled to you and thank you that we have been given the message of reconciliation. Or would you open our eyes today? Would you move our hearts, fill us with compassion instead of skepticism? Or forgive me for the times I'm cynical. I'm way too focused on my own life. Thank you for the resource you've given us. Help us to steward them well. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.